Won the parable series, yeah. And actually, uh, all right, I just really want the Panda Express thing to come back up so I can take a picture of it. But uh, uh, you have to put in like a coupon code when you do your online order, and I don't have it yet, so. They sent it to the Is it in the email? Yeah. Okay, then in that case, I can just, I can just do that one, yeah. Good thinking. All right, let's stand up and pray real quick. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you because it is a great day. It's a great day, Lord. We are in your house, Lord. We're able to celebrate the liturgy, partake of the communion, Lord. And I know that that is, you know, that is just the best thing that we can ever ask for on a day, Lord. So I ask that you just keep the good times going, Lord, and that right now that you meet us all here in this upper room, Lord. And I know that you have a message uh, when we look into this parable, Lord, because when you, when you spoke these parables, you had so many meetings so much instruction, Lord, so much wisdom in it that you were trying to share, and you felt the best way to do that was in a parable. So, Lord, I ask that you just be with us right now, that you are just speaking to our hearts, Lord, that you give every single one of us a separate message on what it means to one of us and how we can apply it in the coming weeks, Lord. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people. Confession of ours, thanks so much for this church. We pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Christ Jesus our Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, so. Is this on or off right now? On, off, on, off. Sounds off? Correct. It is off. Okay. Ooh, that's very on. Maybe that's better? Okay. So, like we were just saying, um, we are continuing in... Um, the series that we're doing on the parables, and, and I will tell you that I am like really enjoying this because I think when it comes to the parables, we hear them all the time. We've all heard them, but like when you really kind of dig into them, you start realizing that there's like all these layers of them. And um, I know a couple weeks ago, I did the one on the, the guy who was forgiven little and the guy that was forgiven much. And, you know, um, and I know Abuna talked last week on the, the wedding parable. And... Today we're going to be covering the, the laborers in the vineyard. And there's something about this parable. Actually, I feel like I'm going to feed back, so we'll try turning this here. Um, there's something about this, this parable that, like, I never, it never really hit on me. And um, I'm using a book um, from the fathers that are kind of going through these parables and kind of unlocking all of these layers to it. But the thing that's cool about this parable is it literally addresses, like, Everything, whether it's talking about different ages, different generations, different whatever, every single person who hears this parable should be able to relate to it, right? And I think a lot of times when we listen to this parable, you know, at least myself, when I was looking at this, I was looking at it on kind of like the surface level, and I knew what it kind of meant, but I didn't really kind of make it personal. And I think um, if you guys know this parable, actually, I'll just, I'll just kind of read through it real quick. Everyone open up to, to Matthew 20. Um, I, I know that in this day and age, if, if you don't have your Bible, you probably have your cell phone, and on your cell phone, you probably have your Bible. So I'm just going to read through it. It's Matthew 20, 1 through 16. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them to his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went and he went again in the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And in about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, what have you been standing here idle? Um, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you can go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. And, um, and when evening came, he saw the owner in the vineyard and he said to his steward, call all the laborers um, to give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when it come to those who were hired at about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more and they likewise received a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner saying, these last men worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. And he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Did you not agree with me to work for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this man the last, uh, I, I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, and many were called, but few were chosen. And I think like we've all heard that story before. And I think honestly, if we're true with ourselves, when we listen to that parable, there's a part of us, well, who do we sympathize, uh, symp- uh, who do we, um, sympathize with? The guy who worked all day, right? And we're quick to say that, dude, that is not fair, right? Like that guy worked all day and got the same wage as the guy who showed up in the 11th hour. And we're quick to say that that's, that's not fair. Um, and it's a great story, and the sequence of the events on how everything has happened is so important. That's why we kind of read through the whole thing. And, and I want us to spend a little bit of time. And one of the things I didn't realize about this, and, and the father's kind of like shed a light on this, is that there's, there's meanings that everyone kind of agrees on, right? So the early in the morning, it's very, very specific that Christ makes a point that the labors were called at different times. Like you have like the, the first hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the eleventh hour. So what, what does that mean? Um, so some of the fathers will agree, and this is the one that I think that like I always kind of went to, is the fact that, and I think honestly if we were looked at it, I think this is what we all probably a high level think about it, is this is when people um, are called according to like different ages, right? Because we all know that like the, the, the day, you know, could be symbolized as someone's life, okay? Um, some are called during their childhood, some are called during their, their teenage years, middle-aged, some of them even in the 11th hour, right? Like you think about it, we even think of like the thief on the right. We say the thief, the thief on the right stole heaven. Like he lived his life kind of however he wanted, and then in the, in the 11th hour, he professed faith, and he ended up being with God in paradise. And, and, and we look at that and we say, yeah, I think that's the way that we all kind of, that's the way that I always kind of identified with this parable. <clears throat> but there was another one that kind of struck me odd. And I think this was according to St. John Chrysostom, where he says, well, it could be time periods, right? And I'll be honest with you, if you look at like the first one, we start talking about like the periods of life. Um, chances are, if you're in this church right now, you're probably not in your 11th hour. So we're probably one of the workers that, you, you know, you could have shown up in the early in the day, you could have shown up in the 6th and the ninth, you know, and we're, we're, we're going to put some good work in. We've got some life left, right? But when you look at this idea of its time periods, right, what if the first time period was Adam to Noah, if you lived in that time period? Well, what if, the, what if it was Noah to Abraham, Abraham to Moses, Moses to the coming of Christ? What if the 11th hour is Christ to the second coming? Because if you look at it, all of these time periods were so different in the amount of faith that was required. We all so different in what's expected to us. And, and, and I thought about this because a lot of the times, how many times do we think about when we're reading through the Gospels and we talk about like, you know, what happened when like Christ was walking the earth and we say, man, if I would have lived in that period, like if I would have been able to see Christ with my eyes, if I would have been able to feel his touch, if I was one of those lepers that was healed, right? Like it would have been so much easier, right? If we would have just walked with Christ. But here's my question is, what do you think all of those time periods think about us? Like you got somebody from like Adam to Moses, right? And they're gonna say, well, I had nothing, right? Like I had nothing to go off of other by faith. And like what, maybe some oral teachings. But you look at this other generation, they already saw what happened. They saw how it played out. They have the Bible, they have the writings, they have the fathers, they have everything. Okay, fine. Let's say we fast forward a little bit, right? Well, what if we talk to the generation of people that lived during Christ's period? They say, well, you saw how it ended, right? Like we were all questioning, who is this guy, right? Like there's no way this guy could be God wrapped in flesh. And, we, and they look at that and they say, that doesn't make any sense. How were we supposed to believe? This was so outside of anything that even could resonate with us. And they're looking at us and they're saying, you already knew about the third day. You knew about the resurrection. You saw the, you saw the apostles turn the entire world upside down. And I thought about it. I said, you know, when you look at it on that basis, who's in the 11th hour? 
That's us. We are the workers in the 11th hour that we already saw how everything played out. It all, like all that work and the burden and all of this other stuff that our forefathers had to go through, all the hard steps of faith that they needed to walk through to get to where we are right now, they're the ones who burdened with the labor in the sun. And us, it's all written out for us. We know exactly where we're at, right? <clears throat> but everyone agrees that the real teaching in this parable happens in the second part of the parable. It's all about when the, the owner calls him back for the laborers. And St. John, he does something, St. John Chrysostom, he notices something. And one of the things you've got to remember when you're reading your Bible, you know, do you think when, when St. Matthew was writing his Bible, he was like numbering his chapters and numbering his verses to make sure that everyone can reference it? Of course not. So somebody take out um, Matthew chapter 19 and read me the very, very last verse of that chapter, which is verse 30. Matthew 19, verse 30. <clears throat> it's like a race. We'll see who gets there first. Yeah, go for it, Noah. Uh, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So, and it's funny because they actually put that at the end of 19, but you almost have to remember that when, when this was written, there was no chapter 19, chapter 20. This was St. Matthew telling a story, right? So that, that is how he, he kind of ends like that. That's the verse right before this parable, right? And to give a little context on like where we're going with this. So in that last portion of 19, it's one of the parts of the Bible that we all know. And, and God bless St. Peter because it, it comes to the part where it says, you know, is it hard for a rich man to enter into heaven? Okay, that's what they ask Christ. Right. And then, um, you know, Christ, Christ responds and he says, anyone, you know, anyone who's left anything for my name's sake will get, you know, the blessings and a hundredfold and all of this other stuff. And God bless St. Peter because he says, hey, we've lost, we've left everything to follow you. God bless St. Peter because he's always that guy who says that one thing that everyone's thinking. Right. But he says, we we've left all to follow you. What shall we have? And Christ's response is, is anyone who's left Houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or land for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But then there's that verse 30 that's included in that same quote. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Okay? So he says that. And then he goes right into this parable where he's talking about the different hours and everyone receiving the same wage. And then the last verse of the parable in verse 16 so the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. And I think that, okay, there's got to be something to that here because Christ has got this parable that is so rich, so much in it, right? And then he has these bookcases on it where he's reminding him before I tell the, par uh, the parable, the last will be first and the first will be last. And at the end, he says it again, the last will be first and the first will be last. So if it's important enough to say it twice, it's important enough to dig in why. And you think about this because what was Peter saying? Peter, St. Peter was telling him like, we've given up so much. We've given up so much, God. We, we left everything for you. What do you think he's expecting to hear? You give up a lot, you're gonna get a lot, right? That, that's what you're expecting. He wanted to be first, right? But what's Christ's response is, is it's not that easy to calculate. That's not the way it works. Right? And St. John Chrysostom, when he starts talking about this idea, right, the, the first will be last and the last will be first, he says the first, the first were the Jews. Think about that, right? Like the first were the Jews. Who, Christ came for the Jews. That's, that's originally, you know, those were his people. They were first. They were there. They came. Some accepted. Some did not. And those that did not will not be first. But who, you know, when you look at that, then guess who was last? We were. The Gentiles. Right? Because the Gentiles were last. But the Gentiles at the same time openly accepted. When you look through the Gospels. Right? Openly accepted. And in that case, he's basically saying that like, hey, then the Gentiles, even though, because the, the Jews were first, but they rejected. But the Gentiles who were last, that they accepted, were switching. 
right? And he also says, it's also likened to the believer who comes early to faith. And this is something that it should convict us, right? Because the believers who come early to faith, who were first, first to faith, they have a long road ahead of them. And a lot of us get tired on that road. And if we lose our passion, if we lose our drive, if we lose heart, if we, you know, if we do not remain faithful, then even though we were first, we can end up being last. Because God rewards according to his purpose. He measures with his own ruler and it's according to his own pleasure. And we can never be prideful about anything when we're standing in the presence of God. Because there's nothing that we've ever done to earn anything that we have. And it's also hard to be prideful when we compare ourselves to other people. Because there's one thing that we have to acknowledge, and if you have young kids, you'll, you'll get this 100%. But we will never know the hearts of other people. Where you could be judging the person who's sitting across from you, but God's looking at a heart that is so white that it, you, you can't even compare. We do a really good job measuring the outside of somebody, but it is only God who knows the inside of somebody. And the funny thing is, is like, you know, if you ever think that in your comparisons that you're not biased, then you're a fool. Because every single one of us, we see the best in ourselves and we see the worst in other people. We discount our best. No, we discount our weaknesses and we discount their best. So we can never ever stand in a position where we can judge. And if we can never, if we can't guess how God's uh, mercy, mercy works, then we shouldn't even try to. And, and I look at times in my life where I was so sure that God was doing something. I thought like, oh, I already know exactly what's going on in the situation. I see the fingerprints of God. I know the outcome here. And I will tell you, even though I'm 100% sure of it, <laughs> I'm wrong. I've been wrong so many times. Because I will tell you, when you deal with God, he deals with us according, according to who he is and not according to who we are, which totally messes up the equation. And I think it's a hard thing for us to remember, but God's character is, pred God's character is predictable, but his actions are not. And so many times we think we know how God's gonna work, and rarely are we ever right. You know, and I think an important point when it comes to this parable, even though like when I kind of alluded to, when we, when we read this thing, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna jump to the defense of the guy who showed up early in the morning and worked all day and got the same wage, right? We wanna say that that's not fair, and how could that happen? But an important thing we need to remember is that the owner was not unfair to anyone. He wasn't. There's not one person in that story that got the short end of the stick. Was he more generous to others? Without a doubt. But should we be upset when God decides to be generous with somebody else? Because one of the things we need to realize is that if he chooses to be generous with somebody, that is out of his goodness. But God is never unfair. For his own purpose, God does things that we will never understand. He will work with people in ways that we never understand. He will give greater blessings on someone that we will look at and say that that person is less deserving. But who are we? Because okay. again, that is our opinion. That is our vision. That is our very limited scope to see that what God is doing here is not right. They don't deserve it. But that's only our opinion. Our perceptions are always biased and always limited. I'll, I'll share with you guys a personal story. I remember I was growing up, one of my friends, um, I've always had the relationship with God where if I take like two steps out of line, I'll get smacked, right? <laughs> like, like the wrath of God comes and kind of like straightens me right back out. And um, I had this other one of my friends that whenever he would start, you know, straying, God would bless him and bless him and bless him. And then he would keep blessing him. And in those blessings, my friend would feel like guilt and like repentance and he would get back on track. And I remember there was a certain time where I said, you know what, God, I want you to deal with me the way that you deal with him. It's not fair. Okay. Like. I'm sick of it. Like, I, if, I, if I look at something wrong, wrath of God comes down upon me, straightens me out. This guy does God knows what, and you're blessing and blessing and blessing and blessing. And I promise you guys, that led to a period of my life where about 12 to 18 months of unparalleled blessings 
and 12 to 18 months of unparalleled, uh, unparalleled misery. There was no God in my life. And at the, end of the, at the end of that time period, I say, you know what, God, you can take back the blessings. I don't want them. I'd rather have you. And it was a reminder to me, or it was confirmation to me, that God says, I treat you the way that you need to be treated, not the way that you want to be treated. So a lot of the times when we're looking at how God's dealing with other people, and we say, I'd rather have him deal with me that way. And God's saying, I'm dealing with you exactly how you need to be dealt with. So the wages in this story, you know, this, denar this denarii, stands for God's gift to salvation, eternal life, citizenship. And St. Augustine pointed out something great in this parable, that each of these laborers responded when they were called. The ones that were called early in the morning responded. Sixth hour, ninth hour, eleventh hour, called, responded. That single act right there in that story is probably more than a lot of us can say that we have successfully done. We should learn that from this parable because even though they came at different times, each one of them answered when they were called. And think about that. Think about your own life. Think about it. When did God call you and did you respond right away? One of my biggest regrets was I didn't respond until I was 19. My whole life could have looked different. I wasted 19 years of that, you know? And, and, and I wonder, how many years did you waste? I hope the answer is none, but in reality, I know that we've all wasted. Because there might be accepting the invitation to go to work in his vineyard, like in this story, but it could be that he was calling you to do other things as well. Calling you to take other actions, to take other services, to do other things. And at the same time, we need to learn here because when he called, they responded. And I think if we were honest with ourselves, a lot of us will look at that worker in the 11th hour who received the, the denarii, and we'd be like, I want to be that guy. Right? Like, I just want to be that guy. I want to be able to do what I want to do. And in the 11th hour, if I can respond, and I can go to heaven, and I can be with God, and I, actually, if I can avoid hell, then, then that's a win. Right? And we convince ourselves that we're going to do this, but we're going to do it later. Like, I still have time. I have a lot of time. We're still young. We still got a lot of runway to go. We're just going to put off the decision. And then once I achieve this and this and this and this, then I'm going to give God everything. But there's a key problem with that concept. James 4, 13 and 14. Come now to you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such a place in such a city. Spend a year there. Buy, sell, make a profit. Wherever you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Vanishes away. And we all know that that's true. We all know people that have gone way too young. We all know people who have gone way too old. But at the same time, even in that fact that they were not young anymore, they were still pushing the envelope and they waited too long. Even if it was something for tomorrow. And they did not have tomorrow. We see this in another parable as well, too, and we'll probably cover this on a different day, but the parable of the rich fool who was building bigger barns to store his crops, his goods, you know, and they're full. And he says, man, my, I've got too much stuff. I have to tear all of this stuff down and build bigger so I can keep more and I can hoard more and I can acquire more, which is a little bit of this mentality where we have to be honest in that it's never enough. But this rich fool... It was never enough. And if he, would have bought, if he would have built those bigger ones and he would have filled them, you know what was happening right after that? Bigger ones. Because we'll never be satisfied with the earthly possessions. And honestly, even if, if you look at where we are in life right now, compared to where you are now, how many zeros is enough? Right? In your bank account. How many zeros is enough? In your, in your, in your house. How many bedrooms is enough? Or in your house is. How many houses are enough? But the reality of it is, compared to what you just answered right now to what that answer would have been five to ten years ago. And chances are we want more. But in that story, with, with that fool, it says, that night God tells him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And it's a reminder that, like, 
when we have these long-term plans, especially when they involve God, like we don't have that sort of time, right? We need to learn from this, from this parable here. It says, when they were called, they went. If God is calling you to do something right now, do it. Respond. And then the beautiful thing about this parable, and I love the audacity of this, right? Because we all know who everyone stands for in this story, right? So you have the landowner, right? And then you have the laborers. What do the laborers start doing? They start complaining about the landowner. And now we know who the landowner is in the story. <laughs> like you, you can't do that, right? <laughs> you can't complain about God. God's perfect, right? They were so offended that those who worked less were given equal to them. And honestly, I don't get it. Like I said, we read the story. If there's somebody we side with here, we kind of side with them. Um, but again, the landowner reminded them, I've been completely fair to you. We did you no wrong. I have not broken any promises. And he tells them, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Dude, that's a tough statement. Is your eye evil because I do good? And what I love about this parable, and it's, it's something you see somewhere else in the Bible, is did he make any explanation for his decision? Did he tell him why I felt like I needed to give this guy a denarii? No explanation at all, right? Rarely does God give an answer. How many times have you questioned God and you say, God, I need to understand why you're doing this? Or you need to open my eyes about like why I got this or why I didn't get that. And I will tell you in 42 years of, uh, of life, he hasn't answered me. But that's okay though, because when I look at the book of Job, I think we've got 42 chapters of it, right? Where he's just going through it and he's like, sorry, but like kind of railing on Job, like hardship after hardship after hardship after hardship. And then at the very end, Job's just saying, what's the deal, God? What's the deal? And God just shows up and he, all, his whole response is, this is who I am. I am God, and this is who I am, and that's it. But what I love about this, because when you look at God and you say, well, really, God? I don't know if that's really fair. You say, you're right. It's not fair, right? But do you know why it's not fair? It's not because he robbed the early worker. It's because he decided to be so generous with those who came later. And when you look at the events of the story and how it kind of plays out, you have to show that he was, you know, he was making a point here because it would have been very easy for him to pay who first? The early ones, right? He could have called all of those that came in and gave him the denarii and then they went away. And then he could have called the sixth hour, gave him the denarii and everyone would have, would have walked away happy. No one would have complained. No one would have felt shortchanged. The early morning guy would have felt he was made whole. The 11th hour guy would have felt that he was very, very generous, but all would have been very, very happy, right? And that would have all been fine. But I'm going to tell you that sometimes God does things to stir up what's inside of us because he needs that stuff to come out. Because if that stuff doesn't come out, he can't deal with it. Um, I'm going to, I'm almost done, so I'll just go on a small little tangent. One of my favorite stories in the Bible Right? It's in the gospel where St. Peter, when he rebukes Christ, right? where he basically says, you can't die. And then Christ tells him, get behind me, Satan. Right? And he says, Satan has been asking for you. And I ask that when you fall, get up and strengthen your brethren. And for the longest time, I'm like, I just don't understand that. Like, God himself is telling St. Peter, like, Satan's been asking for you. You're going to fall, but... Get up and strengthen your brethren. And you say, why doesn't he just prevent them from falling? Like, if I was St. Peter, I would be like, just prevent me from falling. Like, why are you going to let me fall? But the reality is it was the pride inside of Peter that allowed him to rebuke Christ. Right? And tell Christ that there's no way that this is going to happen. And Christ needed him to be humbled because he needed to work that out inside of him. Right? Right? So he had pride, and he was the only one that night that rebuked, I mean, that denied Christ repeatedly. Because sometimes that stuff that's inside of us needs to come out so that Christ can address it. Because you think St. Peter in the book of Acts was a very humble individual. And the only way that he can get there was for him to fall flat on his face that night when Christ was uh, betrayed. 
<clears throat> and that's exactly what happens here. What he's doing with these early morning workers is he's bringing that sin to the surface. He's bringing that out and he's basically saying that I can't deal with this until, you know, this is your evil eye that is causing you to do this. And a great quote that I heard, because you think about it, they all would have been very happy if they all got paid individually. But Christ had a plan on bringing this, like, you know, the, the late first all the way to the early, because comparison is a killer of contentment. The only reason they were so upset is because they compared what they got compared to what the person next to them got. And I remember, and if you've had young kids, one of the things that one of my personal things that I hate to do is splitting food for your kids, right? Because what do you always hear? Let's say I'm going to split a donut for the kids, right? I cut it right in half. It is like as identical as I can make it. And I give half a donut to each kid. What does each of the two kids say? Yeah, and it kills me because each kid is like, his piece is bigger. And I'm like, wait, his piece is bigger? Wait, and you're saying, that, okay, then you switch it. You say, still got the bigger piece. I was like, how does that even work? <laughs> That's like impossible, right? But I remember I heard something one time, and they said, the only time I ever want you to look at your brother's plate is to make sure he has enough. The only time I want you to ever look at your brother's plate is to make sure he has enough. And I think if we change our mentality like that too, we stop looking at how, like, you know, what they have, what I have, and we start comparing all of this stuff. You know, imagine if we lived our lives like that. If we were helping each other just to make sure that each other had enough. There's a lot of hardship around us everywhere. But my stuff's my stuff, right? But imagine if we just opened our eyes and the only thing we looked at was whether or not our brothers had enough. So this parable is a warning to those who have been the long and faithful workers. That's the whole point of this thing. He's focusing on those early, those early workers. That's the whole purpose of it, right? To those who left everything behind to follow Christ. And remember, who just asked him? St. Peter. St. Peter basically just said, you know, well, we left all of this stuff. What are we going to get? And he comes back with a warning to him, basically saying, you're going to get salvation, right? And you, you're going to work a lot. And there's some people who are going to steal it in the 11th hour. And that's going to be okay right? This was a warning for people who felt that they might deserve more reward for their faithfulness than the later rivals. You know, this is clearly addressed in another parable too. You see a lot of these things kind of like intertwine. Prodigal son, older son never left the father's house, always there working for the father, right? But he envied the treatment of the party that the son, that the son received, right? We also see it even in the early church, and I don't know if you guys even really knew this, but if you, if you think about it, even the apostles at the, at the beginning, they were very leery of St. Paul. They're like, who's this new guy? Right, he's, he's calling himself an apostle. He wasn't here. This guy was persecuting the church, right? To them, St. Paul was a late arrival. But at the same time, they got past it, right? The Jews had a hard time accepting the late arrival of the Gentiles. And I'll tell you, the, the Father says something beautiful about this concept of the whole 11th hour, right? Because when it says that when he found them, I, uh, it says when, the, when they went out and they found them idle, right? All of the workers found them idle. He says, why have you been standing all day? The response is, no one hired us. It says, the Gentiles, it wasn't their fault. Right? They were not to be blamed for the late arrival. No prophet had been sent to them. And I'll be honest with you, the fathers are basically, they're, they're looking at this as a call of evangelism, right? They're saying, today, there are a lot of people in this world who are completely idle. And you want to know why? Because no one invited them. No one invited them. That's our job. We should be telling them that there's work to be done. Our prayers that let us be loving, let our actions match what we say, let our worship be so sincere, right? And let us invite others into that. And let those that be received, let them come with joy. And let them be received by joy, because they're also to be forgiven, because envy has no place in God's vineyard. So to those who may be the first, might be the last, might be disqualified completely, the reality of it is, is the, the huge problem with this story with the early workers is that they were filled with pride. And pride is a, it's a cancer in our life because pride will always lead to resentment 
and resentment always ends with selfishness. In 1 Timothy 3, uh, no, actually, I, I don't know. I forgot to write down the chapter. In a chapter in 1 Timothy 3 and 4, it says, For this is the good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come in the knowledge of truth. And that should be our mindset as well. Is the fact that, look, even if we are the early risers, the guys that got there first thing in the morning, 3rd, 6th, ninth, 11th, our job is to go out there and to find more laborers, to invite them into the vineyard, to accept them, and then to be happy for them when they get the same thing that the rest of us get, which is eternal life. Um, and glory be to God forever. Amen. I, usually, I, I know I usually just stand up and pray. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Anything that they want to add? Then we'll stand up and pray. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are such a great God, Lord. You are a God who you just want to bring us all into your vineyard, Lord. There's so much to be done, Lord, and, and you are a generous God. No one will ever feel cheated with you, Lord, but we might notice how generous you are. So, Lord, I ask that you allow us to be generous people as well because, Lord, that is the only way that we will not look at you and think that we're getting shortchanged. But Lord, we know that you are a loving God and you are a God who just wants to gather all of his children into you, Lord. So Lord, I ask that you just be with us, Lord, that you give us your mind, your mentality, your love, your sense of generosity, Lord. I ask, Lord, that, the, that while you call us, Lord, whether it be into your vineyard or to specific tasks, Lord, because I feel that many of us here, we are, we are already in your vineyard, Lord. But Lord, I ask that we need jobs to be done. So, Lord, I ask that you, just, that you just guide us on that and that you show us exactly where you want us to work. You give us specific tasks, duties, Lord, and that you give us the strength to accept them. Because, Lord, we want to serve you. We want to serve those around us. We want everyone else to find what we have found, Lord. That you could be glorified, Lord, and that we can celebrate you in heaven for eternity. And I ask in session of all your saints from our tears. Here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. By the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.